Welcome to the 150th episode of the Secondary Science Simplified podcast. I can't believe we're here. I mean, when this started, I was like, I'm going to give it a year and just kind of see what happens. And um, it's turned into being one of my favorite things. I feel like I can communicate with y'all and answer your questions better orally in this capacity than I can in a written format and all of that. So I'm super grateful for all of y'all who have tuned in over these past 150 episodes and listened. It really is such an encouragement to me. So I'm really grateful for each of you. So if you've been around here from the beginning, you know that every about 50 episodes, I like to celebrate by doing kind of like an Ask Me Anything themed episode. So like a Dear Abby situation, if you will. If you are a millennial like me, then you'll get that reference. So you all sent in so many questions and they were so great. And I want to be sure to do each question justice. So I'm actually going to divide this episode into two parts. So we'll do part one this week and part two next week. So if your question that you submitted isn't answered this week, stay tuned. I promise it will get answered next week. So all of these questions came through emails you all sent me when I reached out asking for questions and also on Instagram. So that's kind of how I collected them. So without further ado, let's just dive into this Ask Me Anything kind of smorgasbord episode. This is Secondary Science Simplified, a podcast for secondary science teachers who want to engage their students and simplify their lives. I'm Rebecca Joyner from It's Not Rocket Science. As a high school science teacher turned curriculum writer, I am passionate about helping other science teachers love their jobs, serve their students, and do it all in only 40 hours a week. Are you ready to rock the time you spend in your classroom and actually have a life outside of it? You are in the right place, teacher friend. Let's get to today's episode. Okay, so the way this is going to work is there's not really going to be a rhyme or reason to kind of the order of the questions. I'm just kind of threw them into a spreadsheet and we're going to work through them that way. I will say that I there were about three questions that were a little bit more personal, less like teaching related. And so I'm going to do one of those at the end of today's episode and then the other two at the end of next week's episode. So if you're not into that, don't worry, that's kind of towards the end. We'll kind of get to that eventually. Also, I try to do the more general questions that would apply to the most people in the beginning. And then the ones where people sent me really specific situations you wanted help with are kind of in the middle. So that's the general framework, but it is Pretty random, so just stick with me and hopefully there'll be some good stuff in here that's helpful for you too. The first couple of questions were related to coworker and admin expectations. So somebody asked, how do you handle other people in your department? Half bleeping, I'm not gonna say the word because I wanna keep this from explicit, but y'all know what I'm saying here, half doing it, half doing their jobs and not following NJSS alignment other than tattling on them. So how do you handle people in your department not doing what they should be doing? And kind of a related question I felt like was another person asked, how do you get your PLC, your professional learning community, on the same page as admin? I have a lot of thoughts, and I think even though these are two distinct questions, my answers to them overlap. So the first thing I want to say is you need to get really, really clear on what the actual expectations are from admin. Even this concept of NGSS alignment. There are so many schools that are NGSS schools that are doing this very, very differently. You know, there are some schools that are really committed to the three-dimensional nature of NGSS. Others are simply just using the DCIs from NGSS as their state standards and saying they're in NGSS schools. Others are full send Like you're on a three course integrated science schedule, you're doing storylines, like you're doing the most. Even if like we're just talking about NGSS here specifically, like there's so much though that needs to be clarified. I've also found that most admin that I've worked with at least have no clue what really NGSS is or what it entails. I will never forget sending it under an administration, y'all, that kept using the term PBL. And sometimes they were referring to problem-based learning. Other times they were referring to project-based learning. And then other times they kept talking to us about a portfolio. And while there are definitely overlaps between project-based and problem-based and portfolio-style assessments, those are three distinct things. And finally, I had to sit down my favorite admin on that team to be like, hey, 
this is really confusing. Like, I don't know if y'all just don't realize there's a distinction here. So I tell you that to say, like, I think sometimes they, unless they have a science background, they especially don't understand NGSS. I had a teacher just the other day who is coming, I think it was from elementary school, and now she's teaching high school science, and she's teaching physical science. And I was like, as I always do, I was like, hey, send me your standards. I'll help you know, like, if this curriculum will work for you. And then the standards she sent me were for chemistry. And I was like, hey, are you teaching chemistry or are you teaching physical science? She was like, I'm so sorry. This is like just what I've been given here. And so she was like, here's all this. I was like, just send me everything you've been given. She was embarrassed because she was like, I've never taught this. Like, I don't even know what really physical science is. I was like, first of all, there's no reason for you to be embarrassed. If I was starting an elementary science class, are you kidding? I would have no idea what to teach. So there's no shame in this. But I was like, send me everything your admin sent you. And y'all, the three different documents they sent her were so different, such different copies of standards. I was like, girl, no wonder you are confused. Your admin doesn't even know what you're supposed to teach. So they can't tell you what you're supposed to teach. So I say all that to say, from personal experience and so many conversations with y'all, get clear from your admin. What is the expectation? Secondly, how required is required? Y'all know that's a question I'm constantly asking. Is this something where it's like, yeah, we want you to do this, but like there's not gonna be any follow through? Okay, then that's good to know. Or is this a situation where like, no, you need to do X, Y, Z, because this is on the EOC or because every single quarter your admin's going to be meeting with your entire PLC to make sure all six biology teachers are using common assessments. You know, figure out how required is required. My third question is, what is your role in this? Are you truly the one responsible for getting everyone to do their jobs? Are you the department chair? Are you the head of the PLC? Is there a requirement for you to get other people to be accountable for doing their jobs? If the answer to that is no, then this is not your responsibility. And while it may be so annoying that people are not doing what they should be doing and you want to, like this person quoted, tattle on them, or it might be really frustrating to be in a PLC and no one's doing what admin want them to do, at the end of the day, if it is not your job to get them to do what admin want them to do, then you need to let that go. Like you have so many other things to focus on. I would not be worried about other people doing what they're supposed to do. Yes, it's annoying for students to go between multiple classes and to go maybe from someone else's class into yours and not be prepared because they're not doing the things that they're supposed to do. But at the end of the day, we have so many variables that go into our jobs. Like you cannot be responsible for these variables that truly are outside of your control, which are these other teachers. So I think you kind of have to let go of that. I will never forget my first job. I told y'all we had at any time we had between four to six people teaching biology. And there was a very strict requirement that we all work together. And at a minimum, we're doing common tests for every unit. I think our admin would have loved if every single thing we did was the same, but we just could not get all the people on board. So that's, again, where I'm like, how required is required. When it came down to it, our admin finally acknowledged it, the differences between a lot of us and our teaching styles, and they were like, okay, at the bare minimum, this is what needs to be the same. And so that is what we did. Now, we were constantly meeting together, sharing what worked well for some people, what worked well for others, and like offering to like be like, do you want to adopt this lab? Do you want to try this? But like if people didn't want to do it, we had to let it go because we couldn't force people to do it, especially people who were very resistant to change. And we had to just let that be. I will also say too, in that PLC, like when we were dividing work up amongst us to be done, we learned who to not assign pertinent things to. So for example, if we had to have a test by a certain day, written so that then we could all review it before we made copies. There was one teacher we never assigned it to because this teacher would be doing it the night before and we never had time to proofread it. And and this teacher would want us then to be all making the copies the day of the test. And it was insanity. So that teacher was never on test writing duty. They were given other responsibilities that were lower pressure. And if they didn't get it done, they didn't get it done. Or they had to be responsible for prepping all the lab for everybody to do because we knew if they're going to do it for their class, they do it for everybody else's. So I think you have to get kind of strategic about that. Now, let's say, though, to actually answer this question, not just brush it off, let's say it is your responsibility to get people on board. That is your job. You're the department chair or whatever. I would say then, here's what is best to do. Again, get clear on the expectations and how required is required. And then two, do exactly what we teach our students to do. You have a claim that this is what is going to, we're going to do this because this is what admin wants. And hopefully that also means this is what's best for students. We're going to back that up with evidence and reasoning. So to get people on board, to help them understand why this is going to be good for students, 
We're going to prove to them how it has benefited students. So you're going to need to move forward first. I do believe with any changes, any initiatives, when there's a group involved, one person has to move first and go first and kind of go out there and take the risk and make the change and then circle back and provide the evidence of how it's benefited your students. And again, once you have that evidence, then you're also going to have that reasoning too of like, hey, they wanted us to switch to NGSS. What is, that has looked like for me this last quarter where I've really gone all in for it. Here's how much better my students have done. Here are the numbers. This is why we all need to be doing this because it's going to change students for the better. So that's what I recommend there. And then the other two things I will say is you need to give them support and you need to give them time. First, support. Our jobs are so overwhelming. And as you know, people are getting thrown responsibilities so last minute It's already too close to the school year starting or having started. Like you can't just say, I'm not going to do this and put your foot down. You get thrown these things. And so then to be thrown another new change is so overwhelming. So if we're going to do that, we need to support them in it. We need to give them the tools to execute this. So for example, if we're wanting to do PBL with the biology department this year, because we think that's going to improve EOC scores, I think first you need to do it for a semester and then have the data to show people then the next year, this is why we're going to do that. Second, you're going to give them the resources that you use so that they can use them too and have a starting place to go off of. You're not going to expect them to do this from scratch. You're going to have the lab, the project, the new NGSS three-dimensional unit plan outline or the the first storyline you want them to do. You're going to have that totally flushed out and you're going to give it to them so that they feel supported in doing this big change. The second thing you're going to do is you're going to give them time to do it. I think it's so unrealistic when admin put these expectations on us to totally transform what we're doing. And they tell us this like at your preschool training in August and that you're starting school in two weeks. You're like, am I seriously supposed to rewrite my entire curriculum to be storyline based? Like that doesn't make any sense. So you need to give them time. And I think the best way we can do this is if you are the leader of this PLC or this department is give your teachers one tiny goal per quarter. Okay, one tiny goal. I even say this when I'm trying to get teachers to grade less. I say like, let's just do something for one quarter and see what happens. Let's just drastically reduce how much we grade for one quarter. Or let's just try the storyline thing for one quarter. Maybe it's even just one unit so they don't feel overwhelmed. I think that can really decrease the sense of overwhelm and give you a little bit more buy-in there. I also recommend if you haven't, go back and listen to episode 71. It's one of the many episodes I've done with my personal chemistry teacher, Zach Matson. And we called the episode, It's Me, Hi, I'm the Problem, It's Me, because When I told him I wanted to talk to him about working with difficult coworkers and admin, he was like, I'm the difficult coworker. So it was a really interesting conversation and it really enlightened my eyes. He has proclaimed on the podcast that, you know, a lot of this gives him major anxiety when they get sent all these changes because he's been teaching 25 years and he's like, I'm still drowning with work-life balance sometimes. Like, I don't want to do all these changes. And so he gave really good advice as someone who's experiencing all of this from that end and doesn't want to change to how to help him change. And so that would be my encouragement to you also. I also think, again, if this is your leadership role, it's your job to advocate to admin on behalf of your teachers. Admin, again, have no idea what goes into our day-to-day and especially for science teachers and how much more is on the plate of a science teacher in a, with lab prep and all of that than there is on other teachers. Like no other teacher, unless except for maybe like the weightlifting coach has to worry about student safety like we do in a science classroom. And so there's so much more into it and they just don't know. And so I think it's your job, like it's the department chair's job to really advocate and say like, okay, this is your change you want us to do. We need to be realistic. Okay, how are we gonna support them? Are you gonna give us funds so that teachers can buy curriculum that's NGSS aligned to do this? Are you gonna give us time to do this? Can we do some micro goals here? Like you help strategize there. I think that will make a really big difference. Now to circle back to the very beginning, If it is not your responsibility, then you got to let go of people not doing their jobs. Again, I know it's so frustrating, especially if their students are then coming into you or if your science class becomes the one that's hardest compared to all the other science classes because no one else is doing the job like they're supposed to. I totally get that. I think you can hopefully win people over over time, again, with the same points of evidence and reasoning to back it up and helping support people. But I just think you need to let go of that responsibility. Also, I think there's a difference if you are the department chair and it's your job to report to admin. I think there's a difference between tattling and, you know, giving realistic updates on how it's going. Like, hey, there's some resistance here. Is there a way that I can partner with you, admin? Can you offer us some more opportunities for support here so I can help bring this teacher 
along and bring them up to snuff type thing. So I think you can, those are some things where you can have some conversations with your admin there. Okay. Next question. I won't be as long winded about. I'm trying to go like every other with like a long answer versus a short answer. So you guys don't just like bail out on me. Okay. Another question was, how do you teach chemistry in a semester? So two nine week periods. I never get through it all. Okay. If you have your students for 90 minutes every day for a semester, you can get through it all. It is tighter than like a traditional schedule where you have them for like 50 minutes every day all year. You're at about a 10% reduction in teaching time, which we talked about back in episodes 147 through 149. I'm going to leak those in the show notes. Those are just the last few weeks of episodes, but I'm talking all about this. How do you get all the content done in a limited amount of time? And we specifically talk about semester block classes. So I will say, go back and listen to those episodes. I go through this in detail, but I do want to encourage you, like if you're seeing them for 90 minutes, you can do it. You're going to have to be strategic. I would not have review days or anything like that unless your review day and your test day are on the same day. Like you have like a 30 minute review and then you give them 60 minutes for the test. You got to cut some things out there. But I give you a lot of strategies for how to figure out how to narrow it down in that time period. And also, I give a lot of strategies for how to like not stress about getting through it all. Because unless you have an EOC or an AP or some sort of standardized high stakes test, there's no reason to stress over not getting through every single standard because who's going to really know and who's going to tell on you for not getting through it all. I'm very much of the mindset like I'd rather do justice a smaller amount of stuff and do it the right way than rush through all this stuff, especially if chemistry is a course that your students need to graduate, but is not necessarily like a prereq they're going to need to go on and take another thing. Of course, if they're in honors chemistry, that's one thing because they might be going on to take AP or something. You can push those students a little bit harder, but you can do it. Go back and listen to episodes 147 through 149. I think that'll answer your question. This question was submitted before I published those episodes. So that's why I think that got snuck in there. Okay, another question was, what suggestions do you have for students who have a grasp of the concepts but need more motivation? I'm assuming like more motivation to engage and learn the content. And for that, I would say, like, if they're kind of getting the concepts that you need them to get, then let's start having some more fun. I'm a big fan, and we'll talk about this in a minute, of really only doing the best labs. But if you're finding that you have the time because they're getting the content, you're not having to do as much remediation to add in extra stuff, like, go for it. More explorative things, more inquiry, more opportunities for students to research something that they're interested in that's related to the content. I know, especially when I taught biology and then with anatomy stuff too, like students love researching disorders and diseases and like ways that the body can mess up. They loved my genetic disorder research project in biology. Those are things that really, really intrigue them. We're in an age of like students listening to, you know, true crime podcasts, like while they fall asleep, like our kids are into this kind of stuff. And so I think giving them opportunities to do that is really, really helpful I think your physics students, there are some really cool engineering connections you can give them. But I think building in more student choice can help with motivation there. And that's one reason why I love projects because it leaves it a little bit more open-ended as opposed to oftentimes a lab and stuff where we're kind of moving them towards one direction. So I would add in more of that. Now that kind of leads into the next question, which is I would like help with finding low-level but engaging labs to share with my 10th grade biology students for every unit. So the first thing I will say for this is you need to do the lab audit. This is a free resource I have. I'm going to link it in the show notes. It's at it's our rocket science classroom.com slash labs. It's one of my favorite things I ever created. Honestly, it goes along with an old podcast episode, but essentially I'm walking you through an audit process of the labs that you do have and helping you figure out which are the best ones to keep and which ones you need to replace. Now, I'm a big, big fan of less labs, but better. So focus on doing one really, really good lab for each unit. And then if you have time to add in more, that's great too. I think one of the things with lower level students is not that you need easier labs, it's that you need more time. You need to take more time and not rush them through the lab. So I would rather have less labs and then be high quality labs, but you have plenty of time built in to walk through the introduction, to walk through the procedures, to collect the data, to analyze it. So that is my recommendation for lower level. Now, in terms of finding engaging stuff for biology, it's a dime a dozen on the internet. There's so much fun stuff for biology. Now, of course, I'm a biology person, so I'm a little bit biased here, but you can Google 
any topic in biology and you're probably going to find a bunch of free stuff. Now, I personally always like recommending TBT because obviously I create resources there, but also because the nice thing about TBT is if you're going to buy a lab or resource on TBT, if it's from a high quality seller, there's going to be an answer key. There's going to be teacher notes. There's going to be lab setup pictures and or videos or something like there's going to be a lot of more implementation support, which is nice as opposed to just finding a handout on Google. But if you don't want to pay, that stuff exists there as well. Now, for some suggestions for you, I'm going to recommend one per unit for the way I structure the units. So if this is helpful for you, you don't have to. But my first unit is biology basics, and I cover macromolecules in that because I think it's the most important topic of all of biology. And I like to cover it very first so that we bring it up in every other unit. And so my murder and a meal lab, it's free in my TBT store. I will link it here too. It's great because it has a bunch of lab skills in it, and it's just really fun. Like kids love it. So I'm going to link that. That is a freebie, and I think that's a great one to do, and it's very engaging. In my cells unit, I really recommend the Gummy Bear Osmosis Lab. I don't have that one available a la carte, but that's like kind of a popular lab. So if you just Google Gummy Bear Osmosis Lab, I guarantee you'll find someone's iteration of it, and it's good enough that you can use that. It won't have the answer key and implementation instructions like mine does in my cells unit, but it's still really good. For energy flow, I have this really large unit called energy flow, and it kind of has two parts. One is introducing them to enzymes and ATP and kind of like the background of those biochemical reactions that they need. And then the second part is the biochemical reactions with photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And they're linked together by talking about food chains and food webs because I like to put the macro with the micro. So in the first part of this unit, I have a lab that's like a simulating a chemical reaction, and it helps students understand enzymes so well. And it's such simple materials. And then I also have a photosynthesis relay activity that's not traditionally a lab, but it's this like whole class simulation activity. And they do this relay and it's just extremely fun. And your students will understand photosynthesis so much better. And that is one that has worked with such a variety of level of students. So highly recommend. For genetics, I don't have a traditional lab here, but I have this scavenger hunt for protein synthesis, and I found it was so helpful, especially for my low-level students, just to practice transcribing and translating over and over, but in a way that was fun. In heredity, I mentioned earlier my genetic disorder research project. Again, not a lab, but it is a crowd favorite every year. And then also, I have these dinosaur genetic stations. They're for review, but they're just fun. And I've just found, and ev- the nice thing is there are like five or six different ways it gets worked out. So you can kind of differentiate for students with the different options there are for doing that. In evolution, my natural selection lab is again, it's kind of another one that's like a standard lab that a lot of people do, but I love it. I love how I have it written up. I love the questions. It helps them really understand and you kind of always get great data from it. It's just, that's where I think it's such a great lab for any level because it's just like a tried and true. You're gonna get excellent data from it. I'll link that too. And then last but not least is ecology. In my ride or die lab, I think every biology teacher should do because they learn so much from it is ecosystem in a bottle. It's a long-term, like month-long investigation that they're gonna do and uh, it's epic. They will talk about it for years to come. So that's my recommendations for biology labs. Okay, how to introduce a science binder in lab notebooks for middle school students. So this teacher asked, do you have students maintain a three-ring science binder? If so, how many sections are there? How do you grade them? How do you set up your lab notebooks? They said, I want to encourage quality, but I feel all over the place on this, especially with the number of students who do not complete labs within the allotted time. Okay, so there's a lot here. First thing I will say, I'm not a middle school teacher. I taught a few sections of eighth grade physical science. That is my only middle school experience. So I never claim to be a middle school expert. I mean, a lot of y'all have been encouraging who have listened who say like, I teach middle school and this has been helpful, but I just... I feel like I always have to put that disclaimer because I don't know necessarily what works for a middle schooler like it does for a ninth grader or a 10th grader, 11th or 12th. Okay, so let me say that. Second thing is I'm a big fan of packets. I'll link in the show notes an episode I have about packets and why I like to use them. I create a packet for every unit and my students store it in a three ring binder. So that is their science binder. I introduce this at the beginning of the year by saying like, this is the only thing that matters for this class is your binder with your current unit packet. I encourage them. They can get dividers and put in, you know, like a semester's worth of packets in one binder. I usually encourage my students like, hey, 
have a binder you keep at home and you put the old packets in it and just have the current packet is the one that you bring to school for this current unit. I give them flexibility though to decide. Again though, that might be too much for a middle schooler to have flexibility. You might need to tell them. I do not do lab notebooks for middle school students. I don't do it for any student. The only one I did lab notebooks for was my AP biology students because that was a requirement that was really encouraged to me by a bunch of other AP teachers just saying, hey, depending on where your students go to college, they may need to prove how challenging their AP course was. So having this lab notebook is really helpful. So I only did that with 11th and 12th grade students. So I personally don't think a lab notebook is manageable for a middle schooler. It was hard enough with my juniors and seniors. So I would not do a lab notebook. I like the packet because it's basically like their workbook and it's really easy, I feel like, for them to keep up with because it's the only thing they have to keep up with. I don't make them keep up with a textbook or notebook paper or any anything else. They literally just have to keep up with this packet. Now, how do I grade them? I don't collect and grade a lot of things. That's something I'm really passionate about. So if I am gonna grade something, we all, I'm like, okay, everyone open your binder to page four, pull out pages four and through seven, come up here and staple them. And then I collect them. And then I would grade that lab. And then when I return it, I literally will be like, okay, open your binders to page four. And they'll be like, there's no page four. And I'm like, exactly. And then I pass back the labs and I say, put them right back into your binder, close the three rings, and then we go over it. So that helps them maintain it. I never, ever, ever collect an entire binder at a time. I think it is way too much. But I think this is a nice kind of like scaffolding. I don't like doing interactive notebooks. I don't like the cutting and the pasting and I don't wanna collect those and grade them. I know a lot of people like that. That's not my vibe. I've, I've always found that this packet strategy with a three ring binder is a happy medium for me. It gives a lot of the benefits that you would get from an interactive notebook. And in terms of studying and having it all be right there and then being able to see it, but it also really scaffolds the organization and isn't like a, a blank lab notebook they have to keep track of. So Hopefully that makes sense and answers that question. All right, so now I wanna share one of the more of like the Dear Abby style questions. So I'm gonna give you a lot of context from this teacher because I think it will help to answer the question better. We all have the same background knowledge. And then I have another personal question and then we'll wrap up this week's episode and then come back for next week because there's so many other good questions. But this teacher wrote in and said, I need some help with classroom management. I'm a first year teacher. I'm teaching seventh and eighth right now and I cannot get them to stop talking. I've done the thing where I stand there in silence until they're quiet. I always rock around the room, give them looks, but I feel like I'm always yelling. I know I need to have some sort of nonverbal signal, but I can't think of one that won't make them feel like they're in elementary school. I would love a podcast episode about this. Also, I'm currently using prime times, which have helped with the beginning of class a little, but I'm still struggling with having them be quiet and get to work. And so I guess my question is, can you share more classroom management strategies, please? So like I just said, I'm not a middle school teacher. So take everything I I say with a grain of salt. But I do have experience with eighth graders and I get it. Y'all, there is, if you haven't taught both a middle school level class, even just eighth grade and ninth grade, y'all, there is like such a distinct difference between an eighth grader and a ninth grader. And I'm not just talking about that the boys grow seven inches over the summer and their voices like drop two octaves. That is a outrageous change that happens between that. It was so crazy teaching eighth grade physical science and ninth grade biology and then seeing the transition of the students like night and day different, but they really are so much rowdier. So the first thing I want to encourage you with, even not being able to say that I'm like a middle school teacher is like, I want to affirm you that they do talk so much. I'm not saying high schoolers aren't talkers, but they are just not as hyper as middle schoolers. I also think middle schoolers, they're still a little bit more children. And I know that like they're so, they're growing up way faster now than they used to, but they are still children in that they're just still so much more excitable and like hyper than I feel like high schoolers are. So I first wanna say like, don't take that personally. I just think that's the age group that you are in. The second thing I'll say is I have a four-part series I did last year on classroom management where I kind of deep dive, deep dove, I should say, into this. Episodes 90, 91, 92, and 93. So I'm going to link those in the show notes. I highly recommend listening to those if you're looking for any sort of classroom management support. Now, I think this is where it's going to be hard, but you are going to have to set the tone. You need to draw a hard line in the sand and you need to hold that line. You need to decide what is allowed and what is not allowed. And the hard thing is at this point, you're probably two or three months into the school year. 
So you maybe let some things happen that you don't want to happen and you're going to have to retrain them and it is not going to be easy, but you can do it. And so that's where I think the routines and procedures episode, again, I'll link that, is so critical. You need to decide what you want the routine or procedure to be. So for example, I do not let my students talk during prime times, period. So if they start talking, they get one warning that reminds them of the expectation. That is, we do not talk during prime times. And I remind them of the consequence. If you speak during prime time, I'm assuming that you're using your neighbor. And that's a big no-no. I always tell them you can use your notes. You may not use your neighbor. And so the punishment in my class is if they're talking during prime time, it is immediately they have to put their notes away. The whole class, one person brings the whole group down. I really feel like, especially at this younger age, they are very influenced by peer pressure. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. So if like two kids are still talking, I say, okay, everyone has to put their stuff away. This is now like basically a quiz that they're a pop quiz because they don't get to use their notes. That really gets them to quiet down. I think you have to just also decide like you will not yell, period. You will stand there in silence. You will ring your bell, whatever. I love having a bell at the front of the room that I ding. And then if I have to ding it twice to get them to be quiet, I take a board point. I think your students would really benefit from board points. This is a whole classroom management strategy I learned from another teacher, a much better teacher than me. And I have episode I just did about this, episode 143. It's my top five favorite teacher hacks. Board points is in there. I would listen to that episode. I think you need to implement board points. I think that would be really helpful. Now, if your students aren't motivated by extra credit, like mine were, I give a lot of ideas for other things that the board points could be used towards. So maybe it's like a catch-up day where they get a free day at the end of the unit that they get to catch up on their work in. Or maybe it's a movie day. Or maybe it's a, you're gonna bring in brownies day or have a Starbucks day where you you know get a couple of, I mean, you probably can't do coffee in middle school. This just shows like, I don't know what you're allowed to do with the seventh grader. Some of y'all listening, you middle school teachers are like, she doesn't get it. And you're right, I don't. But these are things I did in high school. So maybe some of them will translate. But finding a reward that will motivate them. And then the board points, I think, is really, really effective. Again, it's like so simple, but it's something about it being on the board. They can all see it. They all respond to the peer pressure. It just works really well. So I highly recommend that. The other thing I'll say too is if like you want more support on classroom management, I have a bunch of virtual professional development courses, but I have one that's my culture one. And yes, it's about classroom management, but it's also just about everything that goes into the culture of your classroom, your physical space, writing those procedures, all of that jazz, how to be proactive about whole classroom management. I'll link it in the show notes if you want to check it out. But I think that could be something that would be really helpful for you. Because I don't know about you, but I did not have a single course on classroom management in my teacher training. So I get that if you were a first year teacher and you were like, this is overwhelming. The last thing I want to say to you, if you're listening, the person who submitted this question is, I just hope you're encouraged that no class is ever too far gone. You can absolutely retrain any class. You're just going to have to really tighten up and toe the line. And I think and you'll kind of start and test out what punishments work. If it's now like, okay, this lab, we just don't get to do this lab anymore that we were going to do today because y'all can't stop blabbing, you know? I also think building in time for them to share is really helpful. I have to- talked about this before. Zach Matson, again, I'm mentioning him again, but he had, after we'd kind of go over our starter or homework or whatever, so after you go over your prime time, you could set a timer for two minutes and say, okay, any news of interest, anything y'all need to get off your chest, let them share it. Or you could do that at the end of class, even better. The last few minutes of class every day, if we get through everything, this is where you're going to be able to share and talk or whatever and give them that space. Let them do some partner work. Let them work in small groups so they're getting to have those chatty outlets and then you can take those away if they're chatting when they're not supposed to be chatting. I think that's really effective too. But get really, really zoomed in on what your expectations are. Clearly communicate those, consistently reinforce those. And you're going to have to do that more and more the younger the students are, I think. So... That's what I would do if I was you. Okay, to wrap this one up, I'm gonna answer a personal question and then I'll see y'all back next week for the other half of the questions you had. So one of the last questions was, how did y'all go about the adoption process? And this teacher said, it seems so unattainable for most because of the money. So uh, the first thing, if y'all didn't know, our oldest is adopted. We had talked about in our premarital counseling, actually, part of what we had to talk about when we had like this workbook we'd gone through 
with our premarital counselors, but was like, okay, what will you do if these different hard situations happen? Um, Like someone loses their job or whatever. And one of them was like, you can't get pregnant. And we both felt really passionate about adoption, whether we got pregnant or not. We were like, that's something we want to do. It's a really big part of my husband's like extended family. It was just something we felt passionate about. So when we experienced and got diagnosed with unexplained infertility, it was a natural next step for us. We never pursued IVF or IUI or anything just because we just felt like on the same page about adoption. So the first thing I tell anyone um, who's interested in adoption is I recommend reading a book called Adopted for Life. It is a Christian-based book, so just to give you context for that, but I really feel like everyone I've recommended this book to, them and their partner have read it, and it's just they felt very clear after whether or not they should move forward with adoption or not. I think it gives a really clear picture of what it's like. It's not, it's difficult. I mean, if you're entering into an adoption, you're entering a child's life forever and and they're their first parents, their biological parents, you're connected to forever. And it's a traumatic situation. So there's a lot that goes into it. But um, I recommend reading that book and making sure you and your partner are really aligned in your values on this. The next thing I recommend doing is a lot of research. Talk to every person you know who has adopted. This is what we did. And friends of friends, we got the adoption community is pretty small because <laughs> not a ton of people do it, I feel like. So like a lot of my friends who knew that we were thinking about adoption started connecting us with their friends of friends. And those people were so gracious to text or voice memo or whatever. And let me ask all these questions. I think just hearing different stories and a lot of varieties of experiences just kind of opened our eyes to how different this process could look. And then you start assessing your options. Like, do you feel called towards international versus domestic, an infant versus an older child? You know, are you open to a sibling group? Because there are certain countries where you adopt siblings as a group. I think that kind of thing. And then I think you look into the different types of the adoption process. So there's so many, but the general categories would be adopting through DSS and fostering to adopt, adopting through like an agency, and then adopting using a consultancy. So a consultant is going to have you is going to work on your behalf to represent you and apply you to multiple agencies. DSS is the cheapest option. Agency is the middle of the road. Consultancy is the most expensive option, but typically has the arguably the fastest matching and all of that. So I would say if money is an issue, I would consider going through DSS because that's going to be the, you're not going to have to pay agency fees and all of that stuff. I will say though, from multiple people we've talked to that have adopted through that, I mean, I think the hard thing is if you're going to be in a foster situation, even if it is foster to adopt, the goal of fostering is reunification. And so I think your heart really needs to be in the right place, that you are there for this child's bio parents to get healthy enough and the environment to be safe enough that this child can return to them. And if and only if that doesn't work out, you are willing to step in and parent for life. I think um, we didn't feel like we were in the um, had the emotional fortitude, honestly, to handle that when we at the ages we were when we adopted our oldest. I think at this age and stage of life, I could handle that and I could root for those bio parents. We used an agency because um, we couldn't afford a consultancy, and there was a lot of peace knowing like my child's first parents walked into that agency and chose this. The government didn't tell them they had to do it. No one told them they had to. They chose this and they chose us, and that gave a lot of peace there. Also researching open versus closed adoptions. Um, The norm now is open and I'm really passionate about that. I think it's really open is hardest for the adoptive parents and best for the adopted child. But I think if you're only willing to adopt if it's closed, I think that is a sign that maybe it's not the right decision for you um, and it's something to just take more time considering. So gosh, this is gonna get long-winded. I try to make this short. But the main thing I wanted to say is I would never not adopt because of money. There are so many grants, y'all, that you can apply for to get things covered. Also, there are so many people that want to help financially with adoptions. I guarantee if you make that GoFundMe or whatever and that Facebook page, you will get support. I cannot tell you the people who came out of the woodworks and supported us financially. I actually started my TBT store as one of the motivations was to pay for our adoption. And that was a huge part of it. And people, and so people still wanted to donate to us. And so we had them donate different things that we needed. But people were asking to give us money towards the adoption because I think a lot of people 
love adoption or are passionate about it, but don't feel like they have the capacity to do it. And so they love being able to put their money towards helping others do it. And so I would not let the money keep you from doing this, truly. And especially like our agency, it was all in stages. Like you didn't pay all the money up front. You paid like a little bit here. And then when you get to the next phase, once you get to the home study, you pay a little bit there. And then once the home study is done, you pay a little bit more. And like there were all these different pieces to it. So I really... I've like love that you're interested. I feel like if you're interested, you move forward with research and you just trust that the money will be provided because I really have never known someone who was adopted that it hasn't because people will show up and show out for that. Myself included, that's something my husband and I, part of our money every year goes towards helping other people adopt because we're really passionate about that. And so many people helped us when we were younger and I was teaching and, you know, and he he was a young life staff. And so he worked in full-time ministry and we didn't have the money for adoption, you know, and now we have the ability to help others. So what goes around comes around. And I just think don't let money be an option. So I hope that helps. That was more long-winded than I intended. Sorry to Sarah, my editor. I'm grateful for your help. And thank you to all who have listened to this episode. I hope um, you enjoyed hearing the answers to all those questions that people submitted. I hope you come back next week and listen to the other half of the episode. So many great questions. Again, there was no rhyme or reason between how I divided them up between the two episodes. So be sure to come back. There's some great stuff covered in the next episode. And I mentioned a ton of links. So be sure to check out the show notes at it's a rocket science classroom.com slash episode 150 and leave a review. If you have been around this podcast since the very first Ask Me Anything episode at episode 50, if you were here for that one, leave me a review if you haven't already. I would love to hear from you longtime listeners of the podcast. All right, teacher friends, that wraps up today's episode. If you're looking for an easy way to start simplifying your life as a secondary science teacher, head to itsnotrocketscienceclassroom.com slash challenge to grab your classroom reset challenge. And guess what? It's totally free. Thanks so much for tuning in and I'll see you here next week. Until then, I'll be rooting for you, teacher friend.